Jess, welcome back to the Not Carrie Bradshaw YouTube channel. In this video, I'm recapping episode four of Pea Valley. This episode gave us so much to unpack, so let's get right into it. The episode opens with the most appropriate song possible, Future's Mask Off. Mask Off is a vibe regardless, but it especially set the tone for what transpired in this scene. So as per usual, the girls are going off. And y'all remember our homegirl, Lauren, from last season? Lauren from last season, who was our boombox, our soundtrack. Um, Lauren was in there supporting the girls using her divorce settlement money because she cheated on her husband with his own mama. That was her storyline. So she's back at the pink. She's back supporting the girls, spending her stimulus check. <sighs> I remember that stimulus check. It was gone almost as quickly as it came. But that's neither here nor there. I digress. And everything's going fine until toy and them allergies. You're not allowed to have allergies during the pandemic. You're just not. You got to pop you some Zyrtex, some Benadryl, some some, what's the new one? Um, I forgot the new one. Zizol, some Allegra. I say this as a person with allergies. You got to get Nasonex. You got to get Flonase. You got to get on top of them things before they sneak up on you. Toy was not on top of it, okay? So she sneezed right in that woman's mouth after taking off both of their masks. Why'd you do this, Toy? Why? Everything was going fine. Why did you even feel it? necessary but to be fair as we've been navigating the world in the pandemic because it's not over there are those times where you take those calculated risks so this snaps lauren into reality and she decides that she suddenly remembers that she is a regulator for the health department. And it's like, girl, you knew that when you came in here, but you still came in here and you saw all these violations happening around you, but you didn't care until they impacted you. And ain't that the truth? Again, Chuck Elisa is happening in a parallel universe to our real world. And that is exactly how a lot of us handled the pandemic. It didn't matter until it impacted you. And then suddenly, oh, people need to follow the rules. Why you ain't want them to follow the rules before? And we, we could have prevented all of this. So she decides that she's gonna shut down the whole shit. She tells everybody to get the hell out. She starts, starts telling Uncle Clifford and crew that they need HEPA filters which Uncle Clifford refuses to pronounce correctly. And I absolutely appreciate that he called them hippos for the rest of the episode. They need partitions. They need all kinds of things. And it's very difficult to enforce mask mandates, number one, when they're not consistent across all communication. That was a huge failure on our government's part. But then also you're not at 50% capacity, which you're supposed to be, but then it's also strip club. So it's dark. You can't really see, you can't really clock what everyone is doing, right? So she tells the pink that they have 24 hours to get up to code. That's not near enough time, right? And so, of course, the girls are kind of like, Toy, you brought this upon us. Brazil tries to step in and defend her, and here come Roulette. Y'all, I am sick to death of Roulette and her toxicity. Now, to be clear, people don't act like that for no reason, okay? People are not born terrible. In my opinion, there are some cases where nature was just going to do what nature was going to do. And then there are also situations where nurture takes over and a person wasn't properly nurtured and we get roulette. Okay. I appreciate that this episode, we got a peek into why roulette is so overly defensive and so antagonistic with everyone. But it's like, bitch, as soon as they figure this shit out, you get you some therapy. You get on to better help. You use some of the money that you're making from these extracurricular activities, which is what Brazil called her out about. You don't get to be nasty to everybody when you out here breaking the rules because now we got to put you on front street. And if you're going to put somebody like Roulette on front street, you have to be willing to face the consequences. And Brazil was not ready. So she got molly whopped, manhandled, folded up, all kind of shit. I wasn't prepared. Of course, it was giving 
heavy players clubs vibes um players club vibes i was like damn did you paint the bitch um anyway now i want to go back and watch players club again but big l finally comes in and breaks up the fight i'm sorry but it took him too long to come in and break this shit up now if this had been diamond he would have been on top of it immediately they got big l doing too much okay so they break up the fight big l is trying to reason with roulette um Roulette saw Big L and Duffy moving purposes, okay? They also saw her getting out of the car, breaking rules. You know, this is a safe space for sex workers, okay? Get it how you live, Roulette, but we don't break Uncle Clifford's rules. There is no fellatio in the paint, okay? Maybe that's why she was in the car. Maybe she was like, if I take it off premises, then it's okay. I don't know, but either way, Big L is asking her like about a very specific wrestling move and it's like how did you know how to do that we find out that she is mourning the death of her brother who was a wrestler and who taught her how to wrestle and Big L tries to give her I guess like some uncle big brother type wisdom which was the equivalent of Ronnie's make the money don't let the money make you that was that scene I really love the callback to the Bella Noche girls um, when it was announced that the paint was going to be closed and the girls were on the news and it was like, if you can't go to the paint, where the hell could you go? Loved it. Um, of course, the next morning, Corbin Trifling's, trifling ass pops up, right? He's relishing in the fact that the club has gotten shut down. This, this is exactly what he predicted, was hoping you know, prophesied was going to happen. Why does Corbin have so much spice for Autumn Haley? He be calling her all kinds of bitches and hoes, and I just don't understand. Did something happen last season that I don't remember? Why does Corbin have so much aggression towards Autumn Haley? If y'all remember, please drop down in the comments and let me know. But he basically doubles the offer and says, look, I'll give y'all a million right now for the club. This just tells Autumn Haley that, damn, we really are worth more than what I thought we were. So if you were going to go to a million, you'll really go to where I feel like we should be anyway. Slams the door in his face. I still don't like Autumn Haley, but at least she not letting Corbin play in her face. Um, Patrice Woodbine. So the whole thing that's happening in the background of this episode it's almost a subplot, or it's actually almost its own character, is, again, Chuck Elisa is a parallel universe to the real world. So just as we had our summer of 2020, which some people call the summer of George Floyd, where suddenly white people became aware of racism, and they all promised they were going to do better for like five minutes, and there were just black squares on Instagram everywhere. And then suddenly, the racism came back, right? Okay, so in Chuck Lisa, someone has died as a result of police brutality, and protests have broken out, and the protests have rolled over into what some people are calling riots. And protesters suddenly became rioters and criminals. <laughs> so fun. So that's happening in the background of everything that's happening with our heroes, with our main characters, right? So Patrice Woodbine has announced that she is running for mayor. And Patrice Woodbine has also emerged as a hero of the people, speaking very passionately about what these white people are trying to do. And she understands the pain and she's encouraging the, the protesters to go home and all of the things. And Patrice Woodbine is the worst kind of person because she is just as exploitive of poor black southerners as the wealthy white southerners are she just wants to be the one doing the exploiting and i really despise people like her really in my soul um however her very impassioned bullshit speech triggers roulette right so all of the girls decide to come together to help Uncle Clifford get the, the club up to code. Duffy shows up with a truck full of PPE, hippo filters that aren't the real fil the right filters we find out later. And there are also African workers in there who we later hear say this could be a good place for them. And I don't know what that meant, but maybe they felt they found a home in the paint just like everyone else did. I don't know. But everyone comes together to try to get the club up to code, right? And so while they're in the paint, 
working to put up partitions and all of the things, Interim Mayor Kyle announces this curfew and Patrice Woodbine is giving this impassioned speech, right? Roulette gets triggered. She steps off to the side where Duffy tries to console her and he's like, you know, what's going on with you? Duffy loved himself a stripper. Go ahead, Duffy T-Pain. Love himself a stripper. Go off. We learn that her brother, Demetrius, which is the title of the episode, was actually killed as a result of police brutality um, previously. And so seeing all of this is really triggering for her. We never really hear the name of the person, correct me if I'm wrong, but we never really hear the name of the person who was killed in this incident that sparked these protests. I think that that was intentional because there are so many and there were so many back to back to back that to choose one name maybe would have been dismissive because almost immediately after George Floyd, we had Breonna Taylor and then there was also Ahmaud Aubrey how would you choose one name to say what was the thing that really sparked everything? And if that was an intentional choice, I thought it was a really good one, especially because at the end of the episode, they list the names of all the people that we lost in real life. So Uncle Clifford tells the girls, y'all just stay here. Don't go out there in these streets. The, the curfew is for eight o'clock. And it was like, 10 minutes from that time. Some of the girls are like, I'm going to chance it. I'm going to go home. Autumn Haley is like, nah, let them, let them go now. It occurred to me that she wasn't just being an asshole. They didn't know that Autumn Haley was staying there. She had told Mercedes that she was staying with a friend. So they don't know that she's living in the haunted ass pink, right? Now, among the people who come to try to get the pink together is fine ass Diamond. This is Diamond's first time being back at the pink since murder night. He is literally haunted by the murder of Montavious. There's water, there's a, a muddy hand coming up out of the water. It was very creepy for me, okay? Very creepy. But of course, all the girls are lusting after him. We see him and Big Bone finally meet. Big Bone is a woman who knows what she wants out of life. You know, they're dating in real life. Everything's lovely. They both fine. Great. Whatever. Um... So yeah, so the girls discover that Autumn Haley has been living at the paint. Sorry guys, I have so much to cover in this episode, so I do have notes on paper. Now, Andre comes by the club. Let's pull over right here, let's talk about Andre. Andre popped up on his wife in their lovely home in Atlanta. His wife was getting her some, and I said, you know what, good for her. Good for her, because Andre is trash. So he trying to hand the dude up and in my house and all this and that. And it's like, Andre, you're a horrible husband. And it's like, I'm not here to condone cheating, but you're also like a horrible husband, right? And so he uses his wife cheating as the perfect opportunity to reveal that he's going to run for mayor of Chuckalisa since he has learned that he was actually left. What was his name? Claudio? His godfather's house in his will. So he's now a resident, so he can now run. His wife has just got gotten caught going down on somebody else in their own bedroom. And she's more appalled at the fact that he about to really try to run for mayor. It's like, you want to do what now? I'm sorry, but that was funny to me. And it was also because she was like, where's your mask? I'm sorry, but like Britney's priorities, important. Good for her. Good for her, honey. Okay. So... We learned that within their marriage, he has always had an insecurity because that guy was actually the person that her parents always wanted her to marry. He's another doctor. Um, he comes from a, a, you know, I guess more prestigious family. And he, I guess Brittany's family didn't feel that Andre was good enough for their daughter. They weren't wrong. Okay. So he's you know upset about the fact that the house really isn't his per se um and this is also why he didn't want to take the job that um her father offered so it's like instead of taking a job from my father because pride and ego you want to go run for mayor of chuckalisa so i guess their marriage is over who knows what's going to happen with that so of course he runs back to autumn haley as per usual. they're venting to each other and Autumn Haley reveals that she never, which we all kind of knew anyway, that she never intended to 
maintain or preserve the club. It was always her intention to sell. The girls overhear this. And now, of course, they all want to whoop her ass because she cannot be trusted. And Mercedes, once again, quotes what Montavia said. She's very easy to love, but she's also very easy to hate. Truer words were never spoken because I really don't like her. I really don't like, especially because she's like, it's not like it's someone's home. Bitch, it's your home. You are living here. It's literally your home. What are you talking about? Maybe we'll get some more info about her trauma and why she continues to feel the need to pick up and leave. I'm, I think she mentioned something about being in foster care and like always be prepared to live out of a suitcase. Don't ever get too comfortable. Blah, de, blah, de, blah. Sure. But like, must we continue to screw people over because we've been screwed over? Therapy for everyone. So surprising no one they do not pass inspection and i think that this is also kind of reflective of the fact that you give someone 24 hours it's not enough time but there were also supply chain issues in the real world how could they have you know that there, there were shortages of ppe even for medical workers so even though Duffy came through, he came through with what he could and they did their best, but their best was not enough. So the club remained shut down. Um, so let's move over to our girl, Mercedes. Mercedes got the call. She got the text. She got the bat signal to head to the condo to finish the Mercedes experience. She gets there. Coach isn't there. You know who is there? Farah getting some camera equipment. Now, Farah done decided she going to violate the hell out of this NDA and take some photos of Mercedes. And then they have this heart to heart, right? And this heart to heart leads these two women to getting it on. And what was I immediately thinking? Is she going to receive overtime or double pay? Because at this point, Mercedes is this couple's uni unicorn, okay? She's their girlfriend. She signed on to service one member of this family. Now she's servicing two. So I was really happy when she woke up and there was stacks on the on the, the bedside table. All I was thinking was pimp C, money on the dresser, drive a compressor, top notch hoes, get the most, not the lesser. I was, good for you, Mercedes. Good for you. You're finessing, you're doing your best, and your kid didn't ruin your new business opportunity. Ugh. Good for you, honey. Good for you. Um, the Dirty Dozen Tour. Let's get into it. Okay, so first of all, they did make Mississippi look lighter on that flyer. And again, Rome is showing out as a manager. Um, Lil Marta, Wadi, what you doing? It's, it's not going great. We're his endorsement. Um, Gidget joins, joins the crew. Um, this becomes problematic immediately because, and a lot of people encountered this. If you have, um, interracial friendships, it was a real interesting time this summer of 2020 because you really learned where a lot of people stood. Now, let me say, some people learned where some people stood. If you were paying attention, you always knew where your white friends stood and maybe you ignored it for whatever reason. I'm not here to judge. I am here to judge, but I'm not going to judge you to your face because I care about you. Okay. Um, but I don't know you that well, so I won't judge you to your face. Gidget is not as sensitive to the news of the protests as she should be. You know who else is insensitive? Rome. Rome is one of those black people who's like, I want to know what he did to provoke the officers. People don't act like that for no reason. These people out here messing up their own community. He's one of those kinds of Blacks. I don't like him. I don't like him at all. Now, Teague is having a very hard time. Teague is traumatized from prison life and going immediately from prison to being on the road probably isn't great. You know what a person um, probably needs? A routine. Humans thrive when they have a routine. He doesn't have one. He's out here on the road. He's kind of at the mercy of whatever happens. And he's also supposed to uh, provide security. Not a great situation for someone who's fresh at. Not, not great. So he's triggered by the news 
um, that they're hearing on the radio. And Mississippi is kind of trying to get Gidget to calm down a little bit. She's a little bit too excited, a little bit too happy, given what's going on in the world. And that's, again, it's, it's a tricky place to be in if you have a white friend that you care about that you want to call to task, but you don't quite know how to. That can be difficult. Um, and Mississippi got a lot going on. Okay, Keyshawn got a lot going on. She got two kids that she left alone with an abusive husband. Okay, so are they married? Either way. So we hear DJ Never Scare on the radio, and we're all very excited for him. DJ Never Scare is still really eager to work with Lil Murder and ask Lil Murder to send him a feature. Wody just says immediately, it'll be there by tonight, right? Rome asked an important question. Are you going to get publishing? What's the contract? What's going to be the deal here? These are questions that need answers. And once again, Wody's like managerial pr prowess is up for debate. And it occurs to me that if Lil Murder is really going to elevate to the level that he wants to, he really might have to just suffer through the survivor's remorse of hiring some more legit people to manage and secure him. Okay. So traffic is shut down. They're not actually going to be able to go perform that night like they're supposed to. So they decide they're just going to turn up in the hotel room. Now, Lil Murder has to go do his homework, as T put it, to go lay down this verse. Now, T is trying to watch what's going on on the news. They turned the TV off. Did Rome turn the TV off or did Gidget turn the TV off? I don't remember. Somebody turned the TV off and T still has the mindset of like, this is mine. This is my time. This is my, like, don't interfere with like my time. That kind of like regimented, institutionalized mindset, right? Rome is not sensitive to this at all. Rome is not sensitive to anything, okay? He's very much a get money type of person. And that's, I don't trust people like that, that their only goal in life is to get money. What are your other values, honey? Because you'll do anything. You know, you just out here doing lines of coke and talking about money. He's not a substantive person, okay? This triggers the shit out of teeth, okay? He gets very angry about the lack of compassion and empathy for the victims. And he takes this out on Gidget. He thinks Gidget it wants to say the, the N word, but isn't quite, you know, there. And he just completely loses it. He breaks the table. This is triggering for Keyshawn as a domestic violence victim because Teak was really getting heated. So all of this trauma is just bouncing around off of everybody. Okay, so they finally um, carry him out, calm him down, all of the things. Teak goes to Murder's room where he's trying to lay down the, the track, like in the bathtub, I'm guessing for the acoustics, right? He is visibly upset. And Lil Murder asks him, what is wrong with you? This was a moment of intimacy and vulnerability that I really, really liked. I liked that Teak was able to articulate the existentialism that comes from being a Black person in this country and constantly seeing violence against Black bodies. And when you come from an environment where you've become exactly what the system intended for you to become, which is an inmate, he starts asking himself these questions of why am I even here? This world does not want me. And that was such a moment of vulnerability. And I was so happy to see Lil Myrna let him have that moment and also offer him compassion and affection. I was hoping that it was going to be like we saw on Moonlight. If you've never seen Moonlight, that movie ends in what you think is going to be a sex scene, but it's just an intimate moment between two black men who are being honest with each other about where they are emotionally. That's what I thought this was going to be. And a part of me really just wanted it to be that because we keep having these conversations about black men having safe spaces for each other. And I would have loved for this to have been a moment 
where two black men provided a safe space for each other. And one of them was brave enough to be vulnerable and to say exactly what they were feeling and for the other one to have offered them comfort. My only issue with it evolving into a sexual situation is that every time, not every time, but with black men being more honest about not having safe spaces to open up, there is this, this fear that if you open up, you're going to be accused of being gay, you're going to be feminized and all of these things, right? There is this belief that women are inherently softer and more emotional and men are inherently not. That's simply not true. Feelings and emotions are human components, okay? That's what human people are supposed to have. We socialize women to be able to experience the whole realm of emotion. And even within women, some of us are allowed to go further down that spectrum than others. Like black women aren't really allowed to be publicly angry, right? But white women are, right? That's how women are socialized. Men get their emotions socialized out of them. And there's this rejection of anything considered soft, feminine, emotional. I would have loved to have seen that not be a thing and for that moment of intimacy to have just been that, just for the sole purpose that I hate that there's this belief that a man crying, a man emoting, a man, you know, really expressing how he's feeling deeply. I, I hate that that gets, oh, when well, nigga, you gay. And then they had a gay sex scene. Does that make sense? I hope I'm articulating that correctly. I truly have no issue with a gay sex scene. I truly have no issue with any of the sex <laughs> on this show. Um, as long as it's consensual, I, I struggle to watch sexual assault things on anything. So truly, I have no problem with that. I don't believe that there is a conspiracy to feminize black men or anything like that. But just for the sole purpose of us having these ongoing conversations about where men and especially black men can be safe to be emotional and to be vulnerable, I would have loved to have seen that be just that. So they have um, this sex scene, you know, and I was really happy that they showed the use of a condom. We rarely see the use of a condom in sex scenes on, on shows or on movies. So I was really happy about that. And there was also still something just so gentle about, you know, Lil Murder saying like, I got you. I don't know. I thought that was really sweet. And then Chade woke up the next morning. Antique was on some very much why you being weird to me type shit because he found those postcards and wants to know who Clifford was and why you ain't never sent no postcards to me. Fair question. Because that man was in jail and apparently like murked somebody for you and you did not check up on him. So why you ain't sent him no postcards? Questions that need answers. So, um... As an aside, Rome tells Keyshawn that he wants her to always feel safe when he's around and um, says that he's going to encourage Wody to fire Teak. Wody overhears this. We'll see how that plays out next episode. But everyone gets in the golden hearse and it is awkward as hell. You can cut the tension with a knife. And guess what happens? Uncle Clifford pulls a future and actually texts Lil Murda about what's going on. Feels like the world is crumbling. How are you holding up? And this is what Lil Murda has been hoping for. Just a reach out, just a response, just a something. But now he has to also manage Teak's feelings. So this episode gave us a lot, 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 lot to discuss. Um, and shouts out to the actors. Um, both of their names just fell out of my head. I'm so sorry. But I hate that people are criticizing Lil Marta and Teek's characters. People be gay. It's Pride Month. People be gay. It's fine. People be gay and people have gay sex. 
it's a thing that happens and it's fine. Get used to it, honey. Like, move on with your day. I, I don't, this isn't the time or the space for me to go on my diatribe about how full of shit y'all are when it comes to gay black people, poor black people, black people y'all consider to be ghetto. <sighs> That's another conversation for another day. Maybe we'll do that at the end of the, the, of the season. Y'all are exhausting me. I love this show. I thought that this episode was very full and very nuanced. I'm excited to see what else we have to look forward to. I really think that our surprise is that Lil Murda's feature is going to be on a track with Meg the Stallion. And I just love Meg so much. I think I already like fangirled over her, over her on a previous episode. So I'm going to cut this because um, I feel like I've been talking for a while and I will see you guys next time for the next episode. Bye. Ooh, like, comment, share, subscribe. Okay.